I'm former Tempe Mayor Hugh Hallman. I have an unusual opportunity today to interview Barbara Sherman, who served our city on the City Council from 1988 till 1992. But before that, she got heavily involved in aviation issues for Tempe. It's kind of unusual. A, a city that doesn't even have an airport uh, ended up creating aviation commissions to help its residents protect them from aircraft noise from flights that end up over our city. Barbara, on the other hand, is going to interview me, I guess, because I spent some significant time in that uh, effort as well. So uh, welcome Barbara Sherman, council member from 1988 to 1992, longtime Tempe resident since 1964. Glad to be with you. Thank you, Hugh. And the reason we're interviewing Hugh Hallman is because when he became a council member, he developed a documentation about an inch thick of all the important documents, uh, the flight procedures and the letters that had gone between Tempe and, and Phoenix about Phoenix Sky Harbor to how do we protect citizens of Tempe from, from the noise. Well, I think that's actually an understatement because you ran for mayor in 1994 and despite the fact that you didn't win that election, what resulted from that election and the runoff was the new mayor's creation of a new aviation commission, the Tempe Aviation Commission. And uh, with, I think, your effort and that of other people, I ended up being appointed to that commission and being its first chairman. And so it was in that capacity that the Tempe Aviation Commission first developed um, its collection of documents and ultimately helped craft the city of Tempe's policy on where aircraft should be allowed to fly and where complaints should be filed if they weren't flying in those areas. But that really dates back to your work starting in what, 1970? Yes, 1970. How, how did you get involved? I, I became the chairman of a small environmental group called the Tempe Environmental Improvement Committee and we had citizens come to the uh, commission and they were concerned about aircraft noise and were concerned that Tempe wasn't doing as much as it should be to protect them and asked for our help and so we decided to to get involved and we uh, we, f we fought for their interests for the interests of the citizens that were affected by the airport noise. So that was your first effort to learn about aviation noise and and how to deal with it and yes. what year was this? Well I began in 1970 so and we continued on but 44 years to, uh, through today of uh, work in <laughs> aviation issues, that's a, that's a lifetime of work uh, for a hobby. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, following the, the original committee, uh, another committee got formed, the uh, Aircraft Noise Abatement Committee. Yeah, yes, the, and, and that was Mayor Harry Mitchell um, asked uh, and, and made me the founding chair of that committee, but he, he desired that committee when after re deregulation of aviation noise became, um, excuse me, deregulation of air, aircraft um, took place at the federal level, the citizens all over the city of Tempe complained about the um, uh, noise that, that was happening because the flights were, were deviating from the riverbed procedure which we had established. Before. And that was established through the process of your original group back in the early 1970s. Yes, um, we at, at the in the 1970. The reason the citizens came to us was because there was an environmental impact st statement process going forward, and um, sometimes called an EIS, but right. an environmental process that the EPA manages. And what mm -hmm. was the target of the the process? What the was target that? of the process was the building of the North Runway. So Sky Harbor until that time was a single runway airport. Yes. And yes. Phoenix sought to have a second runway built in that yes. era, and as part of that effort, they had to put together an environmental impact statement. Correct. And it was through that process and your advocacy on behalf of Tempe residents that there was an agreement reached. Yes. And what did yes. that agreement have? What that agreement had is, is a very important document that you actually found when you prepared your documentation. Um, it to had keep seemed to have been lost in history for, <laughs> for uh, almost two and a half decades. <laughs> but but the, uh, the fact that the planes were to directed to fly over the riverbed to avoid the residential areas in the downtown area of Tempe. Um, and so that, that was a very important document. So and through, that the, through the magic of graphics, uh, the <clears throat> Tempe uh, Channel 11 uh, skilled uh, craftsmen can put up the picture of that map 
and show really what, what agreement was uh, created so that Sky Harbor could open its second runway. And that was really, if one looks at the map, you can see uh, over the east side of the airport, arrows that point uh, for takeoffs and landings that go in both directions that show that aircraft are supposed to fly over and only over the Salt River Riverbed. And in fact, there are markings on that map that show where the residential areas are, and it even says on that map, avoid heavy residential areas. Yes. And yes. that was the original agreement reached in 1973 to allow Sky Harbor to expand, to get a second runway, and to protect the residents of the city of Tempe. Correct, correct. So that's, that's very important, and that's, that's the basis of all of the subsequent um, negotiations and agreements with this, the city of Phoenix that, that planes would fly over the riverbed and avoid the residential areas of Tempe and thus avoid the downtown area of Tempe also. And by late 1992-93 there were efforts that Sky Harbor sought to have a new third runway Yes. and that that third runway also would have to go through a similar environmental impact statement process and Sky Harbor would have to reach some accommodation with the surrounding residents and neighbors. And you were uh, deeply involved in that process. How, how did it begin? And as were you well, at that time. By that time you'd become involved also. <laughs> how, how did it begin? How did you end up getting involved? <laughs> how did I get involved with the third runway yeah. issue? Um, at that point in time I was no longer on the city council. So you left the council in 1992. Right. And a group of citizens, and you joined us, and we're a, a, a mainstay in terms of good advice. Um, but we uh, tried to look at what were the issues and tried to look at how do we keep the protections that we have. And um, so the eventual intergovernmental agreement was made that, uh, that we're, we're now have a, a legal agreement between Phoenix and Tempe, and the FAA is... Uh, kind of a party to that. So yes. in, in 1994, yeah. the city council of the city of Tempe agreed. It was in the spring of 1994, there was an exchange of letters between the mayors of Phoenix mm -hmm. talking about the bases on which they would agree to agree. And then an agreement was drafted. And as I recall, the group of folks you were uh, heading up uh, it was then called ANACOM, and other people were working to make sure that the agreement actually had real protections for the citizens of Tempe. And it, uh, from that document, you had established an illegal agreement that Phoenix agreed to that the aircraft at Sky Harbor would continue to follow essentially the same procedures that were outlined in 1973. It was what became called the 4DME procedure, and it was a, a distance measuring equipment uh, is what the DME stood for, as I recall. Right, right. And it was four miles from the airport as the first place that aircraft could turn away from the river bottom, and that in addition, uh, aircraft arriving at Sky Harbor from the east over Tempe had to fly over the river bottom and with a new third runway being created mm -hmm. on the south side of the airport <coughs> those aircraft had to fly in as if they were going to land on the then new third runway but if they were first going to land on the center runway a little right. confusing there but yeah. aircraft pilots do that all over the country it's called a sidestep so that they avoid flying over sensitive areas and that the aircraft were only to move over and line up with the new third runway after they'd passed Priest Road. So that essentially aircraft would not ever fly over Tempe residents. And then the third piece of it, as I recall, was that uh, the airport had to be operated in a way that uh, Tempe received only and no more than 50% of the takeoffs and uh, no more than 50% of the arrivals so that the noise uh, that were, was occurring would be equally shared between Phoenix and Tempe and that Tempe wouldn't be punished by having the noisier takeoffs uh, directed over Tempe for a greater period of time. And there's a little subtlety there as I recall it had to be split daytime and nighttime so mm -hmm. that Sky Harbor couldn't choose to send aircraft over Tempe on, on takeoff just at night. Uh, <laughs> and those protections I think you crafted and had uh, put in place for decades before, but they were finally put into a formal agreement called the Intergovernmental Agreement, the IGA is what it's often referred to, and that was in 1994. So the, the procedures you helped establish uh, really are the three, this, the 
four DME procedure on departure to keep aircraft over the river bottom, the sidestep procedure mm -hmm. on arrival to keep aircraft from going over homes, and then the equalization is what it's called, the 50-50 split of departures uh, during the day and at night so that Tempe residents don't suffer a disproportionate share of departures, the noisier departures uh, over their homes. Yes, I, I, but I'm going to have to differ with you. <laughs> As this First, as <laughs> which is uh, um, not all that unusual, is it? <laughs> but um, you give me too much credit. Um, a lot of people were involved in this, and actually the industry in the early days when we began this in 1974, the original radio beacon procedure, which was an old World War II instrument to direct the planes to the riverbed, that was used um, in, in the very first uh, iteration of, of the uh, procedure. Um, the industry came forward with that idea. So it was a combination of the Phoenix Sky Harbor people and the FAA and the airlines that all sat down and tried to figure out how could they um, provide protection for Tempians. They had promised us in the 1973 agreement that they would avoid residential and they discovered when they looked at flight tracks that they weren't. Most of the planes were flying all over, and so what could they do? They used this old instrument for a while. Then it morphed and into then, And a that was a radio beacon <coughs> that was really near the river bottom at Rural Road. Yes. Uh, and so what they were doing in that first map from 1973 was indicating where aircraft would actually fly based on their location from that radio beacon. That's right. And that radio beacon was then replaced by the Vortac, yes. uh, which was installed at where the 101 and 202 now cross over near the Tempe Marketplace. That's and where that was it, its the original old one location. was, right. And then that instrument was moved to a location that's now on the south shore in Tempe, just west of Priest Road. It's up yes. on a hill that looks yes. like a bowling pin stuck <laughs> up on a, a dirt hill with a halo around its neck. And that's the Vortac. And yes. that's a, a device that's used to inform aircraft where they are currently located and help them make their way across the country. Those, those bowling pins are spread throughout the country yes. and they're still used yes. as, as devices to locate where aircraft are. So you helped design these procedures with a whole lot of other people and establish that before 1994, but those procedures then got established in writing in a final contract between Sky Harbor and mm -hmm. the City of Phoenix and the City of Tempe. Now the FAA didn't enter that agreement. What was going on that the FAA wouldn't sign the agreement? Do you remember? I th actually, I know, I, um, as part of their procedure, their f formal procedure, is they, they, they protect themselves from commitments that could, where, in which they could be held liable, or they could be um, uh, have have to pay pay expenses. So it's anything. really not unusual that the FAA refused to sign the contract. That's their typical procedure; is they don't enter those kinds of agreements. But then it was a fairly clever workaround to make sure that Sky Harbor and the FAA wouldn't change the procedures. Uh, on Tempe and, yes, and get out from under this agreement. That's the, correct. Uh, the, the agreement, I think, had the FAA completing a document that was part of the uh, environmental review. I don't remember what the, what the name of the final document is that the FAA Record puts of out. Decision. The anything? Record of Decision, the ROD. So they put out a Record of Decision, and that's right. a thick document right. that describes all of the bases on which the third runway can be built, and that included that the airport would follow these procedures. Yes. yes. And that's how the FAA documented that that's what would happen. And the FAA wrote a letter that specifically said it would never change those procedures without a request from the airport operator, the city of Phoenix. And the contract mm -hmm. between Tempe and Phoenix said uh, that Phoenix agreed it would never ask for changes to those procedures. So that's how it all got locked down so that right. the residents of Tempe would be protected.